Yeah, I met Martin probably three or four years ago, and uh, and um, uh, today when I was listening his uh, his uh, first talk for uh, university teachers, actually I found that uh, that uh, I not only remembered what Martin told uh, three or four years ago when I saw the first. Uh, his his first uh, lecture, but but actually, I designed my uh, my uh, uh, class based on those uh, those recommendations. And uh, but but uh, the the memory is is funny thing actually. Today, I remembered that actually those uh, very simple things uh, were from Martin. Because when I designed this class, I knew that, okay, Martin told me that kind of things are at least uh, what I got uh, from, uh, from uh, Martin's lecture. And, and then I forgot all how I designed my, my uh, <coughs> class. And today, Martin just uh, remembered that, okay, those ideas fr were from, uh, from Martin's lecture. And the ideas were very simple. The ideas were what is, what is, uh, what is learning? Uh, learning is first reading or getting information. Uh, learning is uh, thinking about this. Learning is discussing. And learning is writing. And writing uh, is actually domain specific. Uh, domain specific thing. If you, if you are a programmer, you have to write code. If you are a musician, uh, you have to to perform music, and if you, if you are, I don't know, doctor, then you have to diagnose and treat uh, patients. So, and uh, but okay, that was just my memory, or at least uh, how I remember this, because Martin told that this can be not truth at all, but this is just. Uh, relative uh, my current feeling about uh, all of this. So, and now uh, floor is Martins. Martin is actually professor of uh, VU Amsterdam, and he's also with uh, 0.1 uh, load professor in Taltec. And um, he's working, actually his H index is huge, he's quite young, but H index is already 45. It, me it means this is really, really big. And uh, he works in three domains. Uh, one is education. The other domain is psychology. And the third one is medicine. But OK, Martin will talk about this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the uh, kind introduction. It's uh, my pleasure to talk to you about uh, effective study 
But, um, let's start with why that is needed, or why that's interesting at all. This is a graph of the number of the percentage of students that graduates on time uh, in a, at the bachelor level. And it's an OC, OECD graph with all the countries of the OECD. That's the average. And what you see is that um, less than half of the students graduates on time over all the countries in, uh, uh, in Europe. And uh, some 30% uh, doesn't graduate at all. So we have huge dropout rate. Well, you can think, okay, well, those students weren't worth it. But uh, that's not likely to be the explanation for all of it. Because, for example, you have this huge international variation. On the one hand, uh, the UK, where uh, some uh, 80 to 90 percent graduates. On the other hand, um, uh, Croatia is at no Colombia, where it's uh, uh, less than 50 percent. Uh, you are uh, above average, so very good. Uh, the Netherlands, my country, <laughs> is below average, so not so very good. Especially our students are really slow. That's another example or uh, indication that um, uh, it's not all about ability. That um, you see in many countries that about half of the students graduate, but not on time. So they're able to finish all courses, but they're not doing it in the tempo that they want themselves and are required by the university. Third indication is uh, the difference between the dark blue and the light blue. The light blue are the female students and the dark blue are the male students. And you see that males have a competitive advantage at being slow and dropping out. Uh, I teach mostly in a program where 90% of the students are female and still the male students end up to be the majority of the problem students that we have to discuss. So, um, and well, you can think, okay, well, that Y, y chromosome makes male students stupid and therefore they fail, but that's not the cause because we know that, that it's mostly motivation of those male students that causes them to do badly. So, what I'll discuss is first motivation. And then we go on to um, uh, what that means for how to study as a student, how to not procrastinate, because procrastination is a main reason for why you're slow or you drop out. And then finally, I'll discuss how to write, because this is a specific problem that many students have. Everything is fine until you have this white page or white uh, computer screen, and you, there needs to be text, but you don't know what. Okay, we'll start with uh, motivation. There's a theory that is uh, uh, widely known in uh, the field of education called self-determination theory. It states that uh, uh, students have three needs. They need to feel competent, they need to feel relation with fellow students and with teachers, and they need to uh, feel autonomy. And that leads to intrinsic motivation, which leads to achievement. Um, fine theory, but there are many, many others. Uh, for example, uh, uh, there's a German theory, and uh, Germans uh, like Gründlichkeit, so it has lots of boxes and lots of uh, arrows, but uh, the basis is here. Um, to succeed, you need to be confident that if you put in effort, you're going to get success, and you need to value education. So education must be something that uh, delivers something that you like. And that leads to the behavior that you need to get success, uh, which then leads to success. Well, how do you get to expectation of success and value? Well, there is uh, lots of boxes, but it starts with something called previous achievement related experiences. That's basically just the formulation of previous success. So what leads to success? Previous success. A nice circle. And if you look at the self-determination theory, you actually see the same, because what is confidence, competence? What is it based on? Well, it's based on the feeling that you, uh, it's this feeling that you succeed, and that's based on previous success. So again, you have a loop where 
previous success leads you to be motivated, leads you to do better. Well, we, uh, with a few colleagues, I came up with a huge model that summarizes all theories of, of motivation. Well, this is a really complex graph, so let's build it up really slowly. You have achievement and motivation. To uh, be motivated, you need to expect success and you need to have uh, 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 you need to attach value to learning. Um, that are both subjective uh, 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 judgments. So you can expect success even when uh, uh, objectively you haven't done enough, nearly enough to, to succeed in a course. Uh, this is specifically a problem of one group of students. Would, would you know which one group? That uh, like overconfidence in own success. No? I see uh, about half of the group here consists of that, uh, <laughs> that category. Male, yes. Male students tend to overestimate their likelihood of success. It's one of the, 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 the reasons why they drop out more. They uh, too quickly think that they will make it. Um, and, the, and you need to attach value. And that's also a subjective uh, 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 judgment. Well, together, that's the, like making those sub subjective judgments is a, a process that in psychology is called appraisal. It's like the... the, the the, the, your uh, uh, interpretation of the situation. Well, the term appraisal comes from a research on emotions. Your emotions are also uh, uh, determined by your subjective interpretation of the situation. So say that you um, uh, uh, bought a ticket of the lottery, and there was like this Spanish lottery where you could earn a billion dollars or euros, and you, you uh, bought this ticket and then the, 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 the results come in and you won nothing. Bad situation. You suffered a loss. Then whether you get angry about that deter is determined by how, whether you see somebody else as uh, uh, responsible for this. If you think you're yourself responsible, you feel the emotion guilt or sadness. If you think somebody else is responsible, for example, the, the, the shop owner who sold you the ticket, you feel anger. So your interpretation of the situation determines the, the emotion that you feel. Well, that's also how it works with uh, uh, motivation. Your interpretation of the situation leads to uh, engagement, like the, the will to to, to go for it, but it also leads to emotions that belong to, to uh, motivation. For example, the emotion pride. If you have good results, you can feel the emotion pride that then helps you to be motivated and do more. But you can also feel the emotion boredom, which comes out of the fact that what you're doing is not really interesting, and that then uh, can lead you to change your uh, appraisal and not find anything interesting anymore and not be motivated. Okay, how does motivation uh, affect achievement? Two things, quantity of learning, that's basically how many hours you put in, and quality, what you do with those hours. Turns out that quality of uh, the, the activities is the more determining path. So you can spend lots of hours, but if you do things that are not useful, then you won't succeed. You have to do uh, 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 productive things with your time. And motivated students are more likely to do those productive things. Now, examples are uh, testing yourself. It's a really effective strategy, but it requires uh, uh, effort. It's more effortful than going over your notes again. Motivated students will go for testing themselves. Unmotivated ones will go for reading their notes again. So it's mostly motivation determines the quality of your student behavior 
that then has an effect on achievement. But um, quantity is also determined by outside pressures. For example, most students will put in more hours if there is an assessment than if there is not. Quality also by the quality of instruction. Your in instructor can assign things to you that make your activities more productive. So it's motivation is a force, but it's not the, the ultimate determiner. Vice versa, achievement affects motivation via two pathways. The first is perceived performance. So basically, whether you think that, you, um, uh, that your performance is good. That's also influenced by the way that, that your, uh, um, by the way that professors give feedback. So your performance might be pretty good, but if then the professor writes mediocre and <laughs> gives you a, a lousy grade, then you still will feel as if it's a really bad uh, uh, performance. Um, what does per perceived performance do? Um, well, we'll get to that later. Second thing is pleasure in study. You've probably uh, experienced it. There are courses where the things that you do are just fun. It's not very hard to give, remain motivated for those courses. It's pretty hard to remain motivated for courses where you don't feel fun while doing it. Well, this, uh, the, the word for, for the fun is flow because it, it's not just fun. It's also if, you're, if you become engrossed in an activity, it doesn't need to be fun, but if you don't feel time passing by, that's already enough for it to be motivating. If it like captures you. Okay, and then I'll skip that. How does it um, uh, that play out? Uh, there was one fun uh, study that uh, looked at how these factors affect starting students. Starting students in engineering in Germany. And um, uh, two uh, German scientists looked at how these students were motivated in the first weeks of their uh, study. They all had to do a calculus course. You know, calculus is not the easiest if, uh, well, this is a technical university, so probably lots of you have done calculus. It's not the easiest study. It's not also the easiest course to be motivated for. So they looked at these students over the uh, first weeks. Um, they also looked for after the first weeks, but uh, all the action was in the first weeks. And they looked at something called expectancy, where you expect to succeed. They looked at uh, intrinsic value, whether you think it is worthwhile for you and interesting. They looked at utility, that's basically whether, whether you think it will be, help you in the rest of the studies. At psychological costs, whether it stresses you. And... Um, effort cost, whether you think you have to work a lot. And what they found was that after a week, intrinsic value dropped by a lot. Vice versa, the stress the course caused went up by a lot. And expectant, uh, um, uh, effort also went up. So, um, uh, by some mistake, half of the students um, filled out the form just after they had received uh, feedback and half of them just before. And the students were, or the, the researchers were, were really disappointed that they had made this mistake. But it was actually great because they could look at the effect of feedback on motivation. Well, it turned out that um, uh, feedback is the reason for lower expectation and higher stress. Like the fact that your first results are not what you expect, are worse than you expect, results in that your expectation for whether you will succeed in the study goes down and your stress level goes up. But the lower intrinsic motivation, the, the, the value you attach to what you're learning, turned out to be unaffected by feedback. So it doesn't matter that you get a low grade for it. What does matter is just whether you like the first uh, assignments. Maybe this is something you recognize, that 
uh, in some courses, the assignments are just so boring that you find it really uh, a slug to get through the course. But this is something that your, your instructors can do something about, not you. What can you do? Well, if you look at your activities in study, um, uh, you have to study for exams, you have to do exercises, make assignments, and you have to write. Okay, let's go over those, these in turn. Starting with studying for exams. Well, the point of studying for exams is that um, you learn things and are later able to remember it. So we have to go through uh, remembering. Um, did, was the word relatedness somewhere in this presentation? Yeah. How do you know? Okay, so you could uh, d deduce it from, uh, yeah, from the fact that you know that, uh, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. Well, in general, there's two ways to get to, to such a memory. The first is called recall. And um, if you think of your memory as a big box where everything falls in, well, it so si sounds silly, but it's actually not that bad a metaphor, then recall is fishing in your memory and with a hook trying to get the right uh, uh, memory out. The other way to use it is called familiarity. It's basically using your memory as an echo box. So you shout in uh, a term, a relatedness, and then every memory that resembles this shouts back, yes, yes, I'm here. And then uh, 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 ones that resemble it a lot shout a lot, and the ones that resemble it a little, like uh, dumbness, shout, uh, well, kind of, and this is all summed up to a feeling, and that feeling is called familiarity. And that's also why you recognize things that you might not be able to remember. So you probably know the experience that you see a face and you know that you know that person, but you don't remember where, it's, where you know that person from. But basically, you can recognize, you f get a feeling of familiarity from the face, but you have no memory that you can retrieve. Well, that's because um, recall is a pretty slow process, effortful, and it's all or none. You get, some, uh, you get a memory up or you don't, and it's pretty precise. So you usually, if you get information, then it's, uh, then it's correct. Familiarity, on the other hand, is really fast. You get, uh, your brain produces this feeling almost as fast as it recognizes what you're looking at. Um, it's gradual. So you can be really familiar with something, uh, have the feeling, I know this really well, or uh, 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 not at all, or something in between. But it also produces errors. You can be familiar, have a feeling of familiarity for something that you don't actually know, but that resembles things that you do know. So maybe you have the feeling, oh, I know this person, I recognize this face, but it turns out you don't know the person, you know someone who looks like the person you're seeing. So f feeling of familiarity can be an error. Well, that's something we'll get back to. Well, if you fish in your memory, like with recall, you need a cue. Well, what's the cue? It's basically what's active in your brain while you're searching memory. So if you want to know whether uh, it's uh, uh, relatedness, you start by looking in your brain with this word, but then you can use other things that you know about the word. For example, a uh, uh, lady who knew that it's part of a theory can use that to deduce, oh yes, I have, I've seen it. So you then uses the theory as the next cue. Um, so it's a, something you construct yourself. The difference between students that do well on exams and not well on exams, partly resides in how good they are in finding cues to look in their memory. So if you have a, um, maybe you, you've had a blackout once, so the feeling that you know nothing anymore, yeah? This is, an, this is caused by stress reducing your ability to do any s smart cueing. So stress narrows your attention, and by having really narrow attention, you, you stop your own ability to construct a good cue 
and uh, look in your memory. Okay, so once uh, uh, if you're uh, uh, looking in your memory, you also have to know how your what your memory looks like. Well, there's two kinds: uh, episodic and semantic memory, but the for studying, the important one is semantic memory. That's your memory for all your knowledge. And you can imagine, uh, you, the, the, the model that psychologists use for that is a network, where all concepts that are linked have connections. And um, uh, if you then activate something, for example, you see a canary and your knowledge of canaries is activated, it activates everything it's associated with it. So canary eats bird seed. Well, so your memory of bird seed is activated. Canary is yellow, so so you feel a patch of yellowness in your head. That's, by the way, literally true. So thinking of a canary makes neurons coding for yellow become active. Uh, it's a bird, and then the fact that it's a bird activates all memories of other birds. So uh, after seeing a canary, it's easier to read the word penguin. Because that's also a bird. Well, um, so if you learn new information, then uh, that means adding to this network. So if you see this bird, uh, I don't know you've come across it because it only lives at the Galapagos Islands. This is a so-called Darwin finch. Darwin went to the Galapagos, found these birds that had really uh, uh, that were doing things that in other places um, uh, mammals would do. And he deduced, well, this is um, a finch. And it, um, uh, it, came, it w was blown all over the Pacific Ocean from uh, South America to the Galapagos. And because it was on an island where there was lots of food and no competitors, it evolved in all these species that could fill all the ecological niches. So this, um, uh, this, if you know this story, you already have a network of, uh, uh, of information on Darwin finches. But then the fun thing is, once you know that a canary is also a finch, then maybe you might realize that the a canary is also from a set of islands. What set of islands would that be? It's already in the name. Yes, it's the Canary Islands. Yes, it's exactly the same story. It's a finch blown out of Africa onto islands where there was nothing. And so it started evolving into a different kind, namely canaries. And um, so once you know that, this is actually something I only found out when I made this slide. So now you have a connection between canary and finch that you would otherwise not have. And this is what um, you need to, to build knowledge that lasts. You need lots of connections with the knowledge you already have, because now you have lots of ways of retrieving this information. If you want to retrieve the fact that uh, a canary is a finch, you can think of uh, uh, islands, you can think of uh, finches, uh, you can think of uh, Darwin, and all of it will lead via your network to the right conclusion, namely that a canary is a finch. So that is, so how do you do that in, uh, uh, with your studies? Well, the point is that you have to elaborate. That's a, that's if you get new information, you have to think of all the things it makes you think of. Uh, you can do that on your own. There's tips on internet on, on how to, to get yourself to do that. But uh, a, a few standard ways are self explanation That is with every fact that you learn, try to explain to yourself why it is true. Well, your explanation might be wrong, doesn't matter, but the Trying to think of why it is true helps you uh, 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 link the inf new information to your old network. And that is what you need to, to remember it. Also explaining to fellow students. Um, uh, a weird thing, uh, a finding is that if you, if you have pairs of students where one is a tutor and the other one is, being, being, is a student, 
uh, like if you, for example, uh, become, uh, um, get money to, to, to do uh, uh, tutoring, the one who does the tutoring learns more from this than the one who is being tutored. Later, if you, if you become a teacher, you'll also notice, like, if you teach a new course, you learn so much, and it's, it stays with you. Because having to explain to someone else is a great way of connecting the new information to your existing network. Summarizing is also a way to do that. Because summarizing makes you think of what's the essence, um, and then reformulating it in terms that you find easy to summarize so that also connects it to uh, <laughs> there's uh, like these uh, uh, students sometimes use these little notes uh, that they smuggle into exams right uh, so when I was a high school student I once tried that uh, I made a little note and I summarized everything I knew of uh, organic chemistry on a the note then I put it into my calculator and I thought wow and I'll get it out and, and get uh, but it turned out that everything I had written on it, I knew now from memory. Because like summarizing all those concepts and writing it on a little note was sufficient to, to, all, to know this all so well that I never looked at the note. So uh, since then I've been making those notes but never taking them to exams because I knew that I would know them all. Well, then uh, one that has doesn't... Um, uh, link to to network formation, but is also just generally really well. Oh, sorry. With your with your hands. So the question um, is: uh, Doesn't matter whether you summarize on a computer or summarize by handwriting. No, uh, there was one theory, one experiment that seemed to show that it mattered, but it turned out that that was a fluke and that was just a, a mistake. Uh, what matters is whether you use your own words or whether you copy words from text. So, like many, many textbooks now end chapters with a summary. Rewriting those summaries doesn't do anything good. So you have to formulate the summary yourself. That's the important thing. And this reformulating in your own words, that's the process that makes it memorable. And you automatically do that if you write on a note, because like uh, the note has little space and it's annoying to write by hand, so you tend to be short. But if you do it on a computer, many just type and type and type and type, and then it stops working because you'll, you'll type so many words that that you don't do any thinking anymore. So that's the, 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 the big difference, whether you think about making, reformulating in your own words or not. Okay, the other process that you have to do is testing yourself. So um, the, the retrieving from memory is something you, 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 that improves by, um, uh, by practice. So you have to practice retrieving, and you do that by testing yourself. So um, if you, uh, 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 there have been experiments with how much, how, what, what is the good um, um, proportion of time spent testing yourself versus studying, and you can go up to half of the time spent in testing yourself and still do better than uh, you would if you uh, uh, spend less time uh, testing yourself. Testing yourself is a really efficient way of learning. Okay, so that's the, the, the what. Now, the when. So, if you know what you should do as studying activities, you don't know, still may have difficulty getting yourself to do it. This is the, the process called procrastination where you constantly think, okay, later is a better moment, uh, not now, uh, I don't feel like it, um, <laughs> etc. The um, recent research has shown that the, the problem resides in the illusion that there is a later better time. 
There's not. You're now tired. You now have a hangover. But in one week, you're still, you're again going to be tired and have a hangover. So it, it, there's no sense in, in uh, uh, delaying. But people have this uh, illusion. And uh, it's especially strong in some people. And those people are the ones that are most likely to procrastinate. So uh, an effective strategy against procrastination is to concretely imagine how you will feel next week, the same time when now you think you will be great and study like uh, uh, hell. Or tomorrow. You think, well, I'll do it tomorrow. Imagine yourself tomorrow, how you will then feel. Well, if you're a realist, then you'll probably realize that tomorrow you'll feel the same way. You'll still not like it. You'll still think that you're tired and, and cannot concentrate. So that is already a way to stop this. Well, there's always the, the idea that you have to make realistic plans. Um, if, you, if you plan to spend the whole day and night studying, this is such a mountain of work, such a horrible idea that like, it's easy to think, okay, okay, not now. This, now I cannot do this. But if your plan is to study for 20 minutes with a timer that, that will ring after 20 minutes, this is achievable. You feel bad, you're tired, you have no energy, but 20 minutes is achievable. So that's a realistic goal. Uh, that's a technique called Pomodoro. If you, if you Google, you'll get uh, lots of fun videos on how it works. But it really gets many people to study, not for a long time, but 20 minutes of concentrated work actually gets you a lot done. Like short amount of real concentration is better than long amount of oh yeah, staring at, your, at the page and not doing anything. And then the, f the final important thing is don't rely on willpower. Don't think that it's your failure because you don't have the willpower to, to, to follow up on your plans. This is a human characteristic that we don't do what we want all the time. What um, successful people do is create habits where they don't have to think where they don't need willpower because it's something that they will automatically start doing. Um, think of showering. At a certain moment, most of us discover that like, thinking about when to shower is a waste of time and leads to stinking <laughs> because you'll not do it for too long and then you'll stink. So what you can better do is always shower at the same moment in the day. Always in the morning or always in the evening. Um, this becomes a habit and you'll never stink. Very good. Studying is the same way. If it becomes a habit, if you always do it at the same moment, then it becomes a habit where you don't need willpower anymore. The other way you can do it is by changing your environment. So at home, you're sitting there. There is the fridge with food. There's the TV. Here's this book that you have to read. There's the game computer. And then you need all this willpower to not go there, not go there, not go there. Stick with that book. If you, on the other hand, go to the library and you have to be quiet and there's no game computer, there's no fridge, there's no TV, then it's much easier to, to, to study. So changing your environment is often a better way to get yourself to do something than uh, uh, relying on willpower. And if you look at successful people, this is actually what they usually do. Uh, they, they change the environment to, to get what they need. So for, this also for, it's also true, for example, of dieting. Um, so um, uh, I'm actually horrible with food. If there's like chocolate, I will eat it. So the only way to not become like this is for n no chocolate to be in my neighborhood. And that's, yeah, I learned that and now I do that and that works. Yeah. So um, 
Um, okay, now then how to write. This is uh, a big challenge for lots of us. So if you look at the writing process, um, what you're actually supposed to do is um, uh, do planning, then draft, then revise until you get a good draft. What we are often... Uh, 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 oh, I wanted to start with the uh, assignments. Uh, the planning is also something that really plays in assignments. I cannot, for the rest, tell much about assignments because what you should do with assignments depends on your field. It's all different for different assignments. The one uh, um, uh, trap there is, is something called goal neglect. It's that you start working, but soon forget what actually the purpose is, and so start doing something that's not the assignment. Uh, planning helps because it, it forces you to think about how, what, the, what the end result is. So um, uh, you should not think of a plan as something you could, should stick with. It's more like a route that will get you to the right goal and a way to, get to, to make sure that, that your activities go towards that goal. Well, that also works for writing. Uh, goal neglect is also some problem in writing, for example, that you forget what the target audience is and just start writing as if it's your diary. Um, but then you're, you, 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 once you start, you, you have this curse of the white page. So this first sentence that you have to put on paper or on your computer. And uh, many people cannot write that first sentence for a very long time because they have the feeling that this first sentence should be perfect. Should be, for example, a fun and good way to introduce a topic. Many people start with the top. That's, that's actually not a bad strategy to just start at the beginning of a paper. But um, uh, what you should not do is wait for the inspiration for a perfect first sentence. So the, what, um, the, the, the uh, advice strategy is to think of your first sentences as garbage that you will throw away, but to, that will get you going. So you just start somewhere, you start typing, 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 and to get over your internal critic that stops you from writing, you think, okay, well, those first sentences I'll change anyway. It's just the first start. Okay, fine. But then you problem, get into the problem of editing yourself. So if, if you have this strategy, you should be then able to uh, improve on your first draft. That's not that easy. Like very first uh, short experiment, read this text and find the two mistakes. The red has two mistakes. Have you already found one? Yeah, one. The, yeah, the dead, that's the mistake. And the other one, oh, the V. Yeah. Has, has everybody found the, both the mistakes? Okay, there's two times V, we tend to overlook that. Uh, and uh, the you dead read should have been you read that. Um, we, we did experiments with, uh, with these such sentences and found out that this was the one that tricks most people. <laughs> oh, don't feel bad if you, if you didn't see it immediately. Um, the, this is already hard, but your own text is even harder. And it has a very simple reason. While you read your own text, you remember your... Um, what you thought while reading it, you, so writing it. So you remember what you wanted to say, and that means that if you read your own text, you remember what you want, and, not what, and you don't notice that the text that's there doesn't do a very good job of uh, uh, conveying what you wanted to convey. So what are the, the, the ways out? Um, first, peer review. Uh, that's getting somebody else to read your text. Well, the bad way to do peer review is for that person to suggest other formulations. First, it's annoying. It's annoying that somebody else corrects your text. 
The second, there's no guarantee that it will get any better because that other person is probably a fellow student who is just a bad writer as you are. So that doesn't help. What does help is if that other person reports back what they understood of your text and uh, which parts they found hard to follow and which parts easy. And that helps you to, f to, s to see that some parts of your text are just incomprehensible or convey totally something else than what you wanted to convey. So that's what you can use peer review to, for. Um, you yourself become a peer reviewer if you let the text lie for a while. So if you read something that you wrote three days ago, then you have some distance and you can read it as a reader instead of as the writer. And then it suddenly strikes you that some formulations don't work or that, uh, that a sentence seems to, th that the causality turns around, that what you th think of as the cause in the sentence looks like the effect and things like that. So uh, this is the, the, the good way to, to write. You start long in advance, first produce sentence that you think of yourself as crap be because it gets you going and then you re you're revised but you do it after a while not immediately because immediately you'll have this problem that you will not recognize your own mistakes okay so a bit later than i hoped when we get to the conclusions you have to grow your network there are ways to do that that basically come down to thinking a lot about the material you have to train yourself in retrieving you have to make sure that you uh, don't get stuck procrastinating by getting habits and uh, um, uh, um, uh, changing your environment and uh, now yeah, f do a lot of revising while you uh, do writing assignments okay that's it question what is better uh, yeah. teacher is writing or showing this or students are doing this totally by themselves um, so so if you make a knowledge graph what is better teacher doing it or student student uh, doing it is better and that is because if the student does it they connect it with their own knowledge if teacher does it their, the connections they make might, might fit the network of the students themselves, but might also not connect to the knowledge they already have. So students doing it is better, even though they make mistakes, which is, of course, not the case with the teacher, or less the case. Thank you, Martin. Uh, as a student, I really like lectures. <laughs> But as a student, I understand that uh, after uh, two hours, I uh, actually don't remember anything. So uh, how it's still possible that uh, uh, us as a students are uh, participating in lectures and yeah. how, how it's so hard to persuade teachers that uh, it's not uh, effective uh, yeah. to just talk and yeah. let us to uh, uh, listen yeah yeah it's a uh, that's a very good question first uh, the, the the first part is uh, why do students like lectures has been investigated um, that's um, also another illusion that if if you spend less effort you think you're learning more because it's there is no resistance it feels as if you're smoothly uh, going along. But actually learning is when there's lots of effort. The more effort, more usually the more learning. Uh, so um, the activity where, there, where, where you're just passively sitting back and enjoying the lecture 
is feels like you're learning a lot because it feels smooth, though actually you're not learning very much. The one where you're very active, uh, for example, making assignments, feels like a slug. You're not getting a lot ahead. Uh, uh, it's difficult, so probably you're not learning. Actually, you are learning. That's the, how the, from the perspective of the student. From the perspective of the teacher, probably the, the, uh, the reason why many teachers feel that lectures are good is that they, uh, that they feel there is no mistake of the student. So that, that if they explain it, uh, then the material will get through in the correct way. If the student has to do things themselves, they will make mistakes and therefore learn something wrong. And there is truth to this. So, um, for example, there, there is something called discovery learning, where you have students discover the principles of physics or chemistry or whatever. Students make mistakes and they do it a lot and they don't learn from the mistakes. And therefore, such ways of teaching often lead to, to worse results. So you have to uh, uh, engineer activities that, where students do things themselves, but most of the time get to the good result. That's pretty hard. So that's, that's uh, a difficulty from the teacher perspective. And also, um, uh, uh, short lectures work. So, the, um, uh, for example, a uh, working group where uh, students do something, then there's 15 minutes of explanation, then they uh, continue working, is actually a really good way to teach. The problem with the lecture is that it's one and a half hours, and students don't concentrate for one and a half hours. So it's, it's like the, 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 there, is, there are good reasons to prefer lectures, but they shouldn't result in this monologue of one and a half hours that they often result in. So regarding motivation and uh, the uh, previous success, if I, if I haven't been successful, for example, in maths, but I want to find the motivation. So how can I find the motivation if I don't have the previous success? Yeah, yeah. So how do you break the cycle of bad results, bad motivation? Um, uh, it's um, slowing down. So um, um, making, making smaller steps. So the steps that are manageable, um, that's the way so that you kind of engineer success for yourself. So uh, I have a, a research assistant uh, who, uh, uh, he, he's a psychologist from training, but he does a master's in artificial intelligence. So it means it's really hard for him because he has to constantly know things about programming that he doesn't know. And he um, consciously decided that he would do the, the, the master's program at half the speed. So he now spends twice as much time on uh, every course than the other students that have the foreknowledge. That results in him getting good grades, being pretty motivated. Uh, uh, and he, so he breaks the, the, the cycle of bad results being unmotivated. You could do that with math too. So um, slow down, take it easy and uh, 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 spend so much time that you are pretty much guaranteed to, to make the small hurdle, and then it, well, it will take you more time, but you will also man probably manage to speed up uh, in time and, and, and get where you want to be. Yeah. Thanks. One of the sort of things with uh, that, that Desi and Ryan's um, model uh, for uh, motivation doesn't bring out, but uh, Daniel Pink's, for example, does. And, and for Desi and Ryan, it is hidden in there, which is sort of purpose, why we're doing things. And, and that comes to with sort of that level of success that is success only when your teacher tells you that you did good. When you, when you get that A or five or whatever, you know, that good grade, or is it that, hey, I stuck with it for half an hour. 
like setting that for yourself, that sense of success. Okay, I, I, it's okay if I fail. Sometimes I can sort of agree that, okay, I, I can fail that course, but this like level of success for me is that I actually stuck with it. I didn't give up or I did those 30 minutes or then you know later on three hours or, or whatever. So that could be a, just a little sort of trick for, because for me and Moth, I, I can relate a lot. All right, do we have a question? Yeah. No, that's a, that's a good, uh, good trick. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I just want to uh, share my experience about the uh, study and the teaching because I was, like I said, uh, in a situation when I was forced to teach the subject, which I studied many years, just four years ago. And when I studied this uh, subject as a, was a student, I probably the study 60% of the total uh, information but uh, when I just finished my master and was forced to become the lecturer and start to teach this uh, the same subject, so it was radically increased my you know the association memories, uh, just understanding of everything in the subject because you, when you become the teacher, you become more responsible for information that this is the chore, this is fails, yeah. and this is you know this bullshit. Let's say yeah. <laughs> yeah. just uh, this. The situation with the students remind me exactly the same mistakes which I did during my bachelor degree. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So what can what you can say about this is uh, better to for the student become for some time like a teacher of somebody else in order to increase their you know efficiency of the understanding of the some yeah. knowledges. Or yeah. What do you think? Yeah, yeah. There's uh, this. Uh, that's uh, um, in in high schools they often do that pair students and uh, the good student become the teacher of the of the bad student or the helper and this helps the good students more than it does help the bad students yeah that's uh, that's your makes you, your experience having to teach it makes you gives you, you an overview of the material that you don't get as a learner and uh, connects everything yeah at least i think that's what you said yeah. <coughs> uh, okay. Uh, hello. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for pr presentation. Mm, and uh, I have one uh, question that uh, <coughs> I have used like this kind of tactics that, like uh, tomorrow I, I I I will tell myself that okay today I am partying, doing gaming, all the stuff, and from tomorrow <laughs> I will start to study. <laughs> but then if the tomorrow comes. <laughs> then I feel, oh, hmm, I need <laughs> to uh, start to study. But, yeah. but do you have any research uh, that, uh, to, uh, about this kind of uh, promise that, oh, from tomorrow you will start to st study? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, uh, that's the research I just talked about, that, uh, that many people have the illusion that tomorrow will be different and then they will feel differently and therefore, yeah. And then, yeah, the, the, the solution is smaller, smaller goals for today that you can keep and then uh, uh, so that you start today and not uh, even though that's uh, it's not the ideal day but it's never the ideal day yeah there's also the thing that uh, okay to, the, to today i am uh, feeling very cool because i, I do my parting and, uh, and all yeah. that fun stuff and yeah. then uh, i am getting how to say that feeling that oh it's good to start tomorrow yeah <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah 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 yeah. A, a little addition perhaps to, to this question and, and something that came to mind when, when you mentioned the Pomodoro method. Um, even the 20 minutes sometimes can feel like, oh, that's too much. So something that <laughs> sort of w when it comes down to habit creation, which you also mentioned, uh, is just sort of choosing between, you know, the fridge and uh, the, the gaming PC uh, is just to give yourself like five minutes that I just, I will do this for five minutes. Like I yeah. can read a book for five minutes. I can write a paper for five minutes. So kind of making yeah. the threshold, because the beginning with any yeah. habit is really hard, right? So just making the threshold really, really low. I'll just do it for five minutes. And then once you've started, the likelihood that you continue for the 20 or more uh, yeah. increases a lot. So just giving yourself, okay, I can go and party in two hours. But like right now, I'll just take those five minutes. I'll just do five minutes because then I feel even better because then I'm like, I've studied. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I have a bit uh, different strategy. I leave uh, books and materials everywhere. <laughs> then I go uh, 
to kitchen to cook uh, dinner for my family. I have something there because sometimes I have to wait for five minutes uh, the pasta to yeah. cook and then I open and later uh, yeah. I uh, uh, will carry on because um, I'm already interested and yeah. sometimes I leave stuff in the bathroom and in my <laughs> bedroom and <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's also a good strategy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, actually, I have uh, one question. <coughs> uh, I have a strategy uh, what I teach uh, the students as well. Maybe, maybe this is wrong. I just want your comments. Uh, this is about reading, and and uh, I found that uh, I am able to read my text as a, what it is a peer reviewer when I read the text aloud and slowly. Oh yeah. And yeah. I teach this, uh, to my students that don't send me your work before you haven't read this at least two or three times aloud for yourself. Can you can you comment this a little bit? That's uh, that's an interesting one. Um, that uh, I noticed this actually from therapy that it works there too. That <laughs> in therapy, like many people have um, uh, really weird conceptions of themselves or uh, of, of others, that saying those aloud makes obvious how silly they are. So for example, I never succeed in anything. That's a thought that many people have. But saying that aloud immediately makes, well, that's ridiculous. I succeeded in coming here. <laughs> so, uh, but, uh, and so probably it also works with, uh, with your own text. Yeah, it's actually a good one. It's it's the, it's the it's the matter of uh, verbalization yeah. that you get it out, yeah. that you uh, that it's it's not inside you anymore. That you just uh, like it's uh, it's out there, and uh, and you if you listen yourself, then you will you, then you get get the chance to find this uh, weak points or it doesn't yeah. sound right or something yeah. like this. Yeah, yeah, or or the the simple fact that many students produce sentences that don't that are ungrammatical. Once they read it, they hear it. Yeah. Sorry, last question. <laughs> last question, sorry. <laughs> uh, uh, how, uh, uh, however we plan, uh, life happens. Usually you have like uh, eight, uh, 800 uh, pages and you have only <laughs> 24 hours. Uh, what's the best uh, suggestion uh, how to uh, pass the exam? <laughs> Whoa, that's a good one. So, um, the, 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 the uh, most modern textbooks have summaries. And so the, the, the best uh, time to spend is first look at the, the, the contents so that you know already what's all in there and that you uh, uh, are not surprised by the content and to read summaries at the end um, uh, and then focus on the parts that you don't understand. So the, um, the uh, kind of like you read summaries, you, you make a note on, oh, I have no idea what this means. Then you go read that section. So if you really cramped for time, that's uh, the most efficient. Just a minute, please. Yeah. Uh, just uh, this uh, commenting uh, on this um, uh, uh, structure that uh, for me uh, it helped that uh, I assigned a certain amount of time uh, for uh, specific topics. Uh, for example, I knew that uh, I have uh, X amount of uh, time left uh, to review this, uh, this thing. Then I, uh, I said to myself, okay, this chapter I will only review 30 minutes, this chapter uh, another 30 minutes, and etc. And uh, this uh, also helps to like no, not uh, uh, procrastinate uh, yeah. for learning. Okay, yeah, that's also a good strategy. Yeah. There's one question there on top. Uh, I, I have like a cultural question, I would say. 
So usually, like you talk about like purpose-led learning, you want to have like good purpose so you can have more effective learning. But what happens with like younger people today, or even just people in different stages in life, whether you're like working part-time while studying, is that you have like a lot of these unprocessed feelings before you can actually like get your headspace into the right mindset for effective learning. So there are yeah. like a few constraints in this place, whereby in Estonia, like the Soviet legacy and poor urban planning means that there's like a lot of like lack of like third places. So there's like no um, space. There's like a lot of space, but no places for people to meet organically. And then for like additional backgrounds that I study in IT and n not only um, like I I'm like an older student so it's like bachelors like students are younger and also a lot of my, my classmates are on the spectrum so given these constraints how do you like foster like a culture whereby people can actually help each other <laughs> right because like I, I talk to like a, 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 a lot of time I don't think it's just like you know foreign students face this problem I think my, my local classmates like face yeah. this problem whereby you know you have like so many things that you're working on but then it's like how do you actually like support each other to like you know reach this stage of like purpose-led learning yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Poo, that's a, that's a hard one so uh, um uh we know that community is really important uh and then indeed um if you're if you're a working student and getting to know your classmates is uh is hard and then yeah uh what's what's often advised is try to find students that are in the same situation like you and you don't need a big group you just if you have one study mate that already helps you assign time because you make appointments with that person and you tend to keep them uh, so that's that's the already the habit um, and if you're in the same situation, you can also uh, uh, share advice. That's, uh, um, yeah, uh, it, it remains difficult to juggle work and uh, 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 studying at the same time. There's also the advice that I know that uh, uh, like uh, counselors often give is not to be too ambitious because starting two courses that you while you only have time for one, you usually it's to both failing uh, uh, instead of one succeeding. So if you have are, are, uh, don't have much time, then uh, uh, um, uh, prioritizing a bunch or, or a, a material that you can master and not do the rest, and so slowing down is probably more effective than trying to do everything. Okay, I have a question about uh, rewarding, rewarding myself. Uh, I had uh, three days to study. The first day I studied the whole day and after that, that day I uh, had some fun. The second day I studied the whole day but I didn't have any fun. And the third day I couldn't concentrate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's also, um, I, I don't know if I actually put it on there, but uh, it's generally, where I am, I go. Oh, there. Uh, did I put it on there? Um, there is indeed the. I should. I could have put it on there. A way to get yourself not to procrastinate is indeed to have uh, um, um, to to give yourself rewards in the form of permission to do something fun or to eat something uh, uh, good. So your first day of combining study with fun is probably better than your second day. But that's your, the, I, I suppose that's the conclusion you drew yourself to. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, thank you. Yeah. Thank you for the good questions. <laughs>